very much. Al, can you, come in, can you unmute yourself, Al? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go okay, ahead. I go ahead. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I would like to speak on the uh, on seven features of the 2019's revolt. Huh? So point number one is uh, we need first uh, to have a characterization of last year's revolt. Uh, I believe it was a basically a popular democratic movement, not an independence movement. Neither is it a movement manipulated by the United States or the uh, uh, or UK government. Uh, the movements, I think, uh, 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 do uh, uh, experience some kind of US intervention. There's no doubt about it. And there's also no doubt about one thing is that there are people here who demand for Hong Kong independence. But uh, both the so-called foreign forces uh, and the people asking for the, uh, Hong Kong independence were far from big enough to really influence the movement, momentums, or its direction. Although uh, we must admit that they were able to make some influence, but it is a certain juncture of the movement, not the movement as a whole. What unified the two million protesters were the five demands, which were about opposing the extradition bill, opposing police violence, and also uh, above all else is universal suffrage. These were all legitimate demands. And we must not forget one thing that long before Beijing's denied Hong Kong people universal suffrage, the British government had already done so for one and a half centuries. This is also why I argue that not only the UK government uh, 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 has a duty to stand with us, but above all else, the British labor movement has a duty to stand with us. Uh, with last year's revolt, we can say that for the first time in Hong Kong history, the idea of democracy has taken root in the majority of the people. Uh, the 2014 umbrella movement only got 40% of public support. It was a huge step forward compared to the past 30 years. But in contrast, the 2019's revolt consistently got 60 to 70% of support. And uh, 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 on top of that is that uh, a big sections of the young peoples now grabs the idea that direct actions are always required for democratic uh, struggle. And this in itself is already a spectacular success. And we must not forget one thing that this is in the context where Hong Kong is the only city in China now, which uh, 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 was daring enough to rise up against uh, Beijing. Okay, so uh, point number two is about foreign forces. Eh? Yeah, we touch on that in, uh, in point one. Um, surely in Hong Kong, there were political parties uh, 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 which, which were uh, uh, pro-Trump. But we must also uh, 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 aware of one thing that in general, party politics are very, very weak in Hong Kong, very fragmented, and they, and they don't have any mass base at all. Surely this weakness of the liberals, uh, of those, uh, uh, so I would call the uh, right-wing localists, uh, 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 they are weak, but they are compensated by a big pro-Trump tabloid. However, the tabloid is very, very influential. But it is also true that it did not have any mechanism to make the movement to accept its position. And do not forget that as a whole, the movement was leaderless. It is made of huge spontaneous activists. Such a huge movement definitely included a whole range of contradictory tendencies. And we must not fooled by the highly selective reports made by the mainstream Western media, which often focused on protesters waving the US flags. But however, there were also mass rallies 
supported the Catalonia struggle. I was there and there were 3,000 people uh, expressing solidarity with the Catalonia independence. But these events were underreported. So, um, uh, 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 one was also aware of the fact that the foreign policy, foreign forces in Hong Kong actually is not that foreign. It has always been localized, always been seen as one of the stakeholders in Hong Kong. And who, uh, 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 what makes the foreign forces uh, localized here in Hong Kong and makes its influence felt? It is first and foremost the responsibility of Beijing government because uh, uh, the 1990s basic law allows, officially allows uh, the foreign forces, especially the UK, the, U, uh, the, uh, the, the British uh, government and also indirectly uh, the US government as well uh, could have a foothold here in Hong Kong, even after 1997. For instance, uh, in, the, in the courts of Hong Kong, we still have British judges or Australian judges or New Zealand judges. So uh, the foreign forces in Hong Kong is never that foreign. It has been recognized in the basic law for 50 years. So in certain sense, uh, 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 the foreign governments, especially the UK or the US, is going to get angry is because uh, 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 Beijing has uh, torn off uh, the basic law. So, uh, well, uh, as a leftist, you may say that, yes, uh, these are all colonial legacy and this should be done away with. But they should be replaced by something better, not worse. And replacing British common laws with the Chinese legal system is definitely making worse for us. So if it is what the campus wants, I think, uh, 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 I, I, I really doubt that they are really could be called leftists at all. So it's, uh, now I'll come to the uh, point three. Yeah. It is about uh, uh, one feature of the movements, which I think is quite interesting and quite contradictory. I argue that it is a movement which is politically radical, but socially conservative. It was politically radical because, well, yeah, it has the gut to stand up against uh, the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, and it has adopted very radical means uh, for 40 years, Hong Kong democratic movement has been exceedingly peaceful. Actually, under the leaderships of the old liberals, even civil disobedience itself is very, very radical and they do not encourage at all. The first time this taboo was broken was uh, in 2014 umbrella movement. But and then in last year revolt, it has been elevated to an entirely new plane. But on the other hand, it was a movement which exhibits continuously a kind of social conservatism, which never questioned anything about the, the so-called free market, uh, let alone uh, questioning the huge economic inequalities here. Because the movement was guided, was guided by a perspective, just one perspective, which is about Beijing versus Hong Kong. So anyone who is opposing Beijing, whatever the intention, whatever their agenda, they are still our friends, including Trump. And whenever there were suggestions that we should also concern about the huge wealth inequality, well, this would be considered as totally irrelevant to the current struggle and it would be totally ignored. Most of the protesters gave no thought of this. Was also because, well, since Beijing was the main enemy, so we must try our best to prioritize an all people alliance against Beijing. 
if anyone raises, uh, say, uh, wealth inequality on monopolies by the tycoons and so on, this will be considered divisive. So, um, uh, uh, but above all, it is, uh, there was also, actually there has been always a very strong conservative voice from the middle class and also the upper class that they will oppose in principle of integrating the issues of redistributive justice into the democratic movement at all. I argue that this is because of the deep-rooted social conservatism here. Um, long periods of economic prosperity and half of the populations lives in government subsidized housing, etc. All this has made any leftist critique of free market ideology obsolete. And mind you, it's the laboring class, the working people themselves, they would not really oppose the ideas of welfare state, but most do not feel urgent or confident in demanding for that either. And that is why so uh, uh, small circles of, uh, of the leftists has played no role at all in the movement. Okay, so this brings us to point four, namely the, the influence of localism. Um, for many, I think uh, localism just means, you know, standing up for their Hong Kong identity or that Hong Kong people deserve the right to determine, uh, of self-determination. But it is also true that there has been a hardcore right-wing localism, which is in many instances practically ally allying with the U.S. Uh, uh, government. They were organizationally weak. But the absence of organized left-wing movements allowed the right-wing localist to have a much bigger voice than its actual strength. So, um, uh, 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 I think uh, the uh, uh, I think uh, the, uh, uh, it was not strong enough to steer the whole movement uh, to its agenda, but it was able to say uh, hold individual actions, uh, say for instance uh, appealing to P to Trump, or make the verbal attack on the mainland immigrants and so on. So. Uh, until today, uh, the right-wing localist did not yet have uh, 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 strong enough influence on the whole movements, but it is also true that there is one grave consequence of their existence. The Beijing government has made uh, 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 it's made use of this uh, right-wing localist to uh, 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 to promote the idea that uh, the last year revolt is basically anti-Chinese. This, in the long run, will uh, alienate the mainland Chinese peoples from the Hong Kong people. But there is one big issue that we have to answer. How can a revolution in one city be successful at all? if there is no democratic movements in China. So strategically speaking, allowing the right-wing localists to continue to have such a, to, uh, 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 to be such vocal, is very, very dangerous for the Hong Kong democratic movements in the long run. Okay, so um, I think I have to cut it short. Uh, okay, so um, uh, not point number five is, uh, uh, Carry on for a few more minutes, don't worry. Okay, yes, uh, but I will cut it short, yeah, anyway. So. But then, uh, about, uh, the point number five is, one interesting thing of this movement is that it started with, as a movement which is spontaneous, which is hostile to leadership, hostile to organizations, and a big section, I mean the right-wing locals, are hostile to the working people as well. But what is interesting is, is that at the end of the day, this movement has given birth to a new trade union movement, which is, which, you know, uh, uh, this is just one big 
good one good examples of a really massive and popular movement could be able to do to contradict itself and to bring up something which is astonishing. But I will leave this uh, uh, this point. I mean the new trade union move, uh, movements uh, uh, to our friends Anna. Okay. So number six, uh, uh, the six uh, features of this uh, movement. Um, the rise of localism in Hong Kong could be progressive as long as it also consciously rejects the right-wing discourse of racism and xenophobia. I argue for the demand of Hong Kong self-determination, but it should be linked to the demand for democratiz democratizations of China as well, including the self-determinations for ethnic minorities in all China. If there is a strong separatism among minorities, uh, whatever uh, in Tibet or Xinjiang or Taiwan or in Hong Kong, I think it is the Beijing regime which should be blamed. Nearly a century ago, both the KMT and the CCP pursued for the reunifications of Chinese nation as a response to colonization and occupation by imperial powers. But the CCP's course of actions was different from the KMT from the very beginning. The CCP was to achieve the same ends by the means of recognition of self-determination for all minorities. And this was what had helped the CCP to broaden into a national, a national movement later. I mean, the whole country movement becomes strong enough to take power eventually. Yet, from the late 30s onward, the Chinese Communist Party has gradually abandoned its program for self-determination. And further events prove that the Chinese Communist Party has repeatedly, uh, 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 while later its founding principles, and now today proved itself to be so degenerated that it was it is nothing just a party of a uh, bureaucracy, a party of the capitalist. So I think if a so-called national unification, well, actually I prefer the terms of democratic alliance huh, uh, of Han Chinese and other ethnic minorities or a so-called reunification with Taiwan and so on, not only that it should be achieved on the basis of self-determination, this could not be achieved as well if the CCP dictators, dictatorships remains in power. So I think um, uh, 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 I think this is, uh, the, uh, this point is important is precisely because those campers always argue that the communist party's claims over Taiwan is legitimate. I will argue against them is precisely because. Uh, reunification with Taiwan without uh, 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 self-determination is the opposite of what socialism means. Okay, the last point, uh, and then I will finish. Uh, uh, the, the seven features is, uh, is I think, uh, uh, very important for us is that uh, without the young generations, or what I call the 1997 generation, Without them being the vanguard of the last year revolt, there won't be any uh, big resistance at all. So we must thank them for this. Um, but it is also true that in a year, Beijing has retaliated on us and imposed its national security law on us now. From the perspectives of the direct result of the struggle last year, one could say that we have lost the battle now. And in view of the harsh repression, it will take a long time for the movement to rise up again. And I will argue that uh, while we must acknowledge the contribution of the 1997 generation, uh, who had led a, a, a great revolt, yes, but at the same time, 
we must uh, uh, also acknowledge the fact that uh, there is no hope of success of a revolution in one city because of the relationship of forces is entirely asymmetry. And also, the 1997 generations, despite their courage, are not uh, fully equipped in really uh, charting a correct direction forward. The fact that they couldn't even, uh, you know, they, they, they look to the West uh, 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 as their allies, but most of them have no idea that uh, the Chinese democratic movement is also potentially very important, if not the most important, huh? the very important allies. But no one gives a serious thought over that. So, uh, 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 it, uh, uh, so in the end, I think it is not, I'm not trying to blame them for the, for, for the defeat, because even if they have done the, the, all the right things, we will be uh, overwhelmed by Beijing. So to end this uh, 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 speech, I would say that last year, they thought that their revolt was the end game. They were wrong. It was just the beginning of a long-term struggle. Okay, thank you. Thank you.